Hello and uh, welcome to the European Report. This is the first edition of uh, 2013 here in the European Parliament, here in the heart of uh, Europe. Uh, today's topic of discussions is one firstly we're going to discuss is the uh, controversial new Holocaust Museum that's opened up here in Belgium that's caused controversy. And uh, the other issues we're going to face is the issue of the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Syria and the dangers that chemical or biological weapons could fall into the hands of dangerous Islamist organisations that could use these against Israel and threaten European security. The final issue we'll be discussing is the issue of Iran and how, after Israel's recent war against Hamas in Gaza, how the Iranian regime is continued to fund and rearm Hamas. And we'll be asking what are the implications for this for the ongoing Middle East peace process. I'm joined in today's programme by Henry Bioski, who is the vice president of the CCOJB and the founder of Judaica, and uh, a friend to the European Report, Thomas Sandel and uh, MEP uh, Hanu Takala representing the Central Party and also representing the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. So, gentlemen, welcome to the European Report. Um, firstly, I'll start off with, uh, with you, Henry. Can you just tell us a little bit about your, your background, what you do, and how the, here you're representing the uh, Jewish community here in Belgium? Uh, first of all, uh, I think that I can start with the very beginning, 32 years ago, uh, I started and I founded the first Jewish radio in Europe, Radio Judaica, and uh, I think with this I, I start really so-called career, we don't have to exaggerate. Uh, I'm also the vice president of the CCOGB, as you, as you mentioned, which is the equivalent of the board of deputies of Belgian uh, jury. Excellent. And. Um Hanu, can you tell us, welcome to the uh, European Report. It's a great pleasure to have you on the programme. I know that you're a strong advocate for it. So how did you get involved in, in, in politics and become a, a member of the European Parliament and, uh, and why is Israel important to you? So thank you. I think it's quite a long story, but I'll put it that short. Um, first, I studied the music. I was a young music student in Tampere. It was 1982. And then Ulla Järvile, she was the member of the, our national parliament, Finnish parliament at that time. And she organized one event and she invited me. I sang there in that event and it was Israel event. She was there and then Mike, uh, then Steve Lytle was the other speaker. And um, I have to say that that was the, some kind of turning point that, you know, even though that I was a younger musician, I was quite interested in the, in the uh, politics also and then in that meeting, you know, something happened and I, I decided that in some way I would like to do something for Israel. And it was 1982 and of course I didn't have any idea what it, what, what is going to be. And then um, I studied the music but then I find out that I'm not talented enough and then I went to university, I started to study the education in Lapland and then 1995 the Finnish Centre Party asked me that if I can be the candidate in the elections and, uh, you know, they uh, thought about it that I don't have any chance to be elected. Uh, but anyway, so that was that kind of moment for me that I, then I thought about it, okay, I would like to run for the parliament and, uh, and uh, the Israel issue comes to my heart that if uh, I I'm succeed, then of course I'm the Lapis and Finnish representative, but mainly the Lapis representative in our national parliament. But also, the Israel issue is very important for for me, and I would like to do what I can do in that that field. And then some kind of miracle happened in 1995. I got in the our national parliament, and uh, and then I was the 10 years in our national parliament, and then 2004 I joined it to European uh, European Parliament, and the whole time. I have to say that uh, the Israel issue has been very important for me. So, of course, I grew up the Christian uh, family, and my father was the friend of Israel. So that was the that kind of background that, as when I was a little boy, I already get to know something about Israel and the, that, uh, and Jewish people. So, of course, that was the main thing. But you know, in in the personal way, I met or faced that issue in 1982 when this. MP Ulla Järvelet organized that event and, uh, and I have to say that in that event they said that 
that, that the Soviet Union is going to collapse. And we have to be ready to, to help the people, you know, the Jewish people, that they can go back to home, Israel. And then I thought about it, oh, that's not the real, <coughs> real thing. That it's not, the Soviet Union is not going to collapse. But anyway, I said to my wife that if something like that is going to happen, I would like to take part of this uh, process. I would like to take part and help the people in Alia, and, you know. Yes. And that was the first step, you know. Then, and then, as I said, that, that, uh, then 1995, when party asked, Center Party asked me to be the candidate, I said yes, even though that it shows that I don't have any, any chance. But, but Excellent. So seven years it will happen then, from 1982 to 89, yeah. it will begin to happen. Yeah. Uh, and Thomas, so I want to bring you in because very grateful for your continual ECI support for the European report and the programme. So it wouldn't happen without you. So much thanks to you. Um, but also, can you share some of the activities of that the European Coalition has been involved in in uh, recent weeks, certainly since our last episode back in December? Well, thank you, Simon. It's always good to be back. Uh, and of course, I have to be honest and say it has been Christmas and New Year, and uh, we have uh, been enjoying this this holiday. And I believe, just like uh, like Hanno, when you have a very intense um, year ahead of you, it's so important that we can also have time to to relax and reflect. Um, reflect. But but nevertheless, uh, one thing that I would like to mention. Uh, that is that we have been more and more active in the national capitals of the EU member states. Let me give you one example. In uh, December, before Christmas, we went to Paris. And uh, France, of course, being the, the country in Europe uh, which has the largest Jewish uh, uh, community. And uh, I must say that I, I was almost surprised by their um, concern about the situation in France. But also what they say, said was that um, we, we feel quite isolated, we feel alone, we don't see anyone apart from the Jewish organization really trying to make a difference. So they were really asking and pleading, you know, with the European Coalition for Israel, please could you do something in France? And, and um, I'm happy to announce that we have started activities in Paris, in France, and um, uh, this will be um, followed up in, in other uh, capitals throughout the European Union. We have a similar development also in Stockholm in Sweden, uh, a country which has been faced with uh, new forms of anti-Semitism in the last few years. And um, personally, I will be visiting London in a few weeks' time and coming back again in, in March. So we are looking at uh, finding ways of being more active also in, in London. And uh, I, I know compared to France, there are many good organizations in, in Britain, but I believe that if we can work together, we can create an even stronger voice for Israel also in, in Britain. That's it's definitely needed, that's for sure. And uh, Henry, I just want to, uh, the first topic we're going to discuss is the very controversial new uh, Holocaust Museum that's opened up here in Belgium, not far from uh, Brussels. Um, can you ask why it's caused controversy? Because there's a discussion in the title that's called the Museum of the Holocaust and Human Rights. And uh, there's a lot of critics are saying with this new museum that it doesn't completely focus on the Shoah, but focusing on other human rights abuses and therefore waters down really the horrors of what happened in, on this continent 70 years ago. Well, uh, the answer is in your question. Uh, the problem was immediately this title. Uh, all over the world, I didn't visit all the museums, but I think it's not a mistake that all the museums are called museums of the Shoah or Holocaust, but not and something else. Here, the Flemish government uh, was financing this new museum asked uh, it to be called uh, Museum of the Shoah and Human Rights. Well, generally human rights is a word that don't uh, disturb anybody, but uh, if Shoah is not the main uh, issue where these human rights were totally killed, then what else? So we are astonished by uh, adding these words uh, human rights. but. Honestly, I think that we cannot make a trial before uh, Evans. Of course, the first speeches, the first reactions uh, were very controversial, that's right. Uh, let's monitor this case because uh, we are afraid, to be honest. The Jewish community here is very afraid about this because 
Where is it starting? With the Shoah, that's of course very normal. But where is it going to end? Uh, that's the question today. But I would like to be um, not only waiting for the, the, the future months or future years, we are afraid, I, I repeat it, we are very afraid because with human rights you can start with everything but you can finish with a lot of other things. Uh, 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 we are afraid really about it but we are going to wait because the vice president of this museum, Claude Marie Nover, is a very, very tough uh, leader of the Jewish community in Antwerp. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he, he, he is really... Uh, uh, looking uh, to avoid any problem, and uh, we trust him, of course, about this. For the rest, real, really, we are going to be very, very careful, uh, and he will be very careful, I think. Uh, but let's say that this title is not the best one that have been kin have been chosen. Yeah, uh, and Thomas, I want to bring you into um, this discussion primarily because uh, you know the horrors of the Holocaust, in which over six million precious Jewish lives were murdered in the hands of Nazis. It still casts a dark shadow over the Jewish community across Europe. It also, uh, Europe has a great deal of responsibility and also guilt for the Holocaust and allowing this to take place. Um, thankfully, we've had lots of memorials services across Europe and repentance across various countries and parliaments for their actions within the Holocaust. But doesn't the danger with this museum that it's entitled um, the Holocaust Museum and uh, human rights and also focuses on collective violence that this is just political correctness gone mad and isn't there a great danger we lose the message of the, of the holocaust and really appease some of that uh, european guilt rather than focus on the true horrors of the nazi regime well well again uh, just like my colleague uh, Henri, i can't comment on the Belgian case. I haven't visited a museum. Uh, I can only comment on what I have read, but maybe I should just look at it from a more general uh, point of, of view. And um, yes, it, it is true that there is a danger that uh, uh, Holocaust becomes just another genocide. I think this, this should not be misunderstood. Of course, we need to take action. We need to uh, bring about educational tools to prevent any genocide, any mass uh, murder, uh, racism, uh, xenophobia, in, in any ways and forms. But I believe it's, it's so important to uh, keep the uniqueness of the Shoah. And, and when I say the uniqueness, I often mention this example. How is it that there's only, to my knowledge, only one ethnic group throughout the centuries, going back in our culture to the Book of Esther, which has uh, consistently been threatened with uh, um, annihilation. Racism, of course it's a problem. Uh, genocide, of course it's a problem. But very rarely do you see these uh, diseases be repeated on and on again. To, exam to, to give an example, the, the um, Armenian genocide. Of course it's a, it's a grave uh, um, uh, violation in, in any Way, any way you look at it, but if you look at history um, before the Armenian genocide, if you look at history today, you cannot say that there are any threats to the Armenian people today. Why is it that looking through the, uh, you know, thousands of years back, but still today, you hear the same language as uh, Haman in the book of Esther, you see, hear the same language as Hitler on the streets of Europe today. This is a problem, and it's a unique problem. And if we lose sight <coughs> of this uniqueness, we, uh, we, risk, uh, we, we run the risk of trivializing the Shoah. And, and this is something which we see, generally speaking, from the United Nations to the European Union, in order to gain consensus for our fight against anti-Semitism, it will always have to be uh, combined with something else. And yes, this is a matter of concern. Uh, and Hannah, how important is it that uh, we educate young people about what happened on this continent 70 years ago to remember the Holocaust and to really teach about the dangers of anti-Semitism in our schools? <clears throat> I think it's extremely important and uh, uh, I think that it has to be the compulsory part of the all U European Union member states' um, uh, school curriculum. I know that, for example, in Sweden, they started that kind of process when Jöran Parson was the prime minister and they 
made a special book and then delivered that for every school and and I think that was the young student, uh, 14, 15 years old, w which uh, went through this book and you know, so I think that something like that we, we need in uh, whole Europe and uh, and we have some European wide um, uh, um, education programs funded by the European Union like lifelong learning program and then uh, uh, Europe for Citizen program. The Europe for Citizen program, there is special membrance uh, section also. So I think that uh, through them we, we can do that and it's very important to do because as Thomas already mentioned it, that uh, nowadays when you walk in the streets in uh, all around Europe, you can, you can hear the voice, that kind of voice is what you heard about 70 years ago and uh, anti-Semitism is growing and then uh, racism is growing and xenophobia so we really need something and uh, I do believe that education is the way and uh, how we can how we can uh, reach the people and that's the best and most effective way to to do that so it's extremely well, important yeah. Thomas I think it's important also to to see to look at the demographics that it's one thing if you are 75 80 years old and you may have uh, personal memories of the Second World War, or at least your parents would have been involved. When you look at the demographics today, you say someone who is 15 or who's even 20, he may not even have been born in Europe, his parents may not have been born in Europe, which, which means that their exposure to the Shoah is non-existent. And this is where the real danger is today, that you have people in this age group with no uh, exposure, with no knowledge, and, and um, which was the case in Sweden, they did a survey where a very large percentage of young people say that they were not sure that the Shoah had happened. They didn't say that they denied it flatly, but they were not certain that the Shoah actually did happen. And that's when Prime Minister Joran Persson took this uh, wonderful initiative to, to inform the whole uh, Swedish uh, young population. That's excellent. We need more leaders like him, that's for sure, across Europe. And, and Henry, in the course of uh, research in this program, I was shocked to discover that the new Holocaust Museum was opened recently by King Albert, um, the Belgian king, with the uh, government of Belgium, opposite the Dozen Barracks uh, in Michelin, the site where 25,000 Jews and uh, 352 gypsies were deported to the Nazi death camps between 1944, sorry, 1942 and 1944. How was this allowed to happen and be built on this site? It was not only allowed, it was asked. Since years and years, we, we thought in the Jewish community uh, that uh, like Jacques Chirac did it, like François Hollande did it before in France, that the, the king himself, after a few mayors, of Brussels, Liège, uh, Antwerp, uh, spoke about the responsibility of uh, Belgium, uh, Belgium's administration uh, during uh, World War II, that the king of Belgium should speak, and he spoke. And we are really grateful, the prime minister, I forget, the prime minister, uh, Elio de Rupo, spoke too, in, in Malin, Mekkenen, as, as you want, uh, um, and uh, he recognized uh, this responsibility of the uh, administration, the Belgian administration, in the deportation of the Jews uh, of Belgium. Uh, also, we obtained, directly after the speech of the King and the speech of the Prime Minister, that the Senate, the Belgian Senate, will now go further, because we asked two in the Jewish community to go further, uh, uh, to establish who was responsible uh, 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 and this is very important so we are uh, really grateful because we honestly we wait for a long time but okay let's be positive and, and estimate that this year was a very important year because during 2012 uh, these mayors spoke the prime minister spoke and the king spoke so we are now expecting the, the result, results of the work of the Senate. Uh, of course, in Belgium, this discussion is always very difficult because, as you know, it's uh, uh, not the same uh, feeling in the Dutch part of the country than in the French-speaking part of the country. And in the Belgian common situation, it's always very difficult. Uh, uh, but we hope, really, that it will be, uh, uh, that it will be a solution about this and not to fall again in the 
traditionally Belgian discussion between Dutch speaking people and French speaking uh, people because as, as our friends mentioned it's very important we knew we knew since years and years that that when um, the wit direct witnesses of the Holocaust will disappear and unfortunately it's coming with the time uh, somebody said we will have only uh, called historians speaking about Auschwitz like we can speak today about Verdun uh, uh, or other uh, war terrible war episodes so voila we are in this in, in this situation but was what was declared by the king the prime minister and a lot of mayors uh, in Belgium during 2012 is going in the good direction mm -hmm. to avoid uh, of course this confusion forgetting uh, the, the, the Shoah and we expect now that 2012 13 will be the year of the work of the Senate to go further and to finish this work of memory of the state of Belgium. That's very good. And uh, I want to bring you into this one. Uh, Thomas, Thomas, I had the privilege now of interviewing um, five uh, survivors of the Holocaust or the Shoah and uh, heard their personal stories firsthand and researched the interviews. And one, one thing that comes across more, more important is it's so important to keep these memories alive to honour those who perished at the hands of the Nazis in the most cruel, horrendous death. Um, what is uh, ECI doing in terms of uh, honouring uh, those that were murdered during the Holocaust for Holocaust Memorial Day, which is on Sunday, the 27th of January this month? Yeah. Let me first say that in 2005, the European Coalition for Israel initiated and organised, together with uh, uh, Member of European Parliament, Hanna Takula, the the first uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Day event in this parliament, in the European Parliament. This event has uh, since grown and, and become an official European Parliament uh, uh, commemoration, which will, on the 22nd of January, be held again, uh, hosted by the, the now current president, Martin Schulz. Um, what will happen in this parliament then is that a particular auditorium will be dedicated to uh, the humanitarian the Swedish diplomat and businessman Raoul Wallenberg, which, which will in a way also uh, uh, give a mark to Holocaust remembrance in the heart of this building, which I believe is significant. Uh, we have, as a coalition, called upon faith communities, churches to honor the victims of the Holocaust on the Sunday nearest to the 27th every year. Uh, this year we are cooperating with, uh, with an artist from New Zealand who has put together a, a remarkable and very unique uh, exhibition with interviews uh, from Holocaust survivors. And we will make this exhibition available on our website so that each, uh, I think we agreed that every third day there would be a new uh, uh, film or a new uh, story told by a person. And there's nothing which can, just as, as you were saying, there's nothing which is so genuine and real as having a person who was actually there to explain in his own words what happened. And, and uh, the fact is, of course, that we have um, millions of stories which are all unique. But the sad part is, of course, that we have six million stories which are never told. They have forgotten. And this is the, the least we can do in Europe and beyond to honor those six million victims. But I believe, again, that it's significant that it's happening here in the European Parliament. But I would encourage everyone who is watching this program to go to our website, um, www.ec4i.org and go to the exhibition and, and um, spend a few moments on the 27th remembering these victims. And, and if you are part of a local church, make sure that this is incorporated in the church program so that you can together commemorate and, and pray that it will never happen again. Yeah. And, and Hanno, how, is it, how important is it that uh, for the Holocaust Memorial Day service here in the European Parliament that uh, all members of the European Parliament attend to honour those uh, victims of the Holocaust, but also to remember what happened here on this continent 70 years ago, and also to make a stand against the growing rise of anti-Semitism here in Europe? I think it's 
very important and many times uh, we have that kind of saying that uh, polit politicians they have very short memory you know about two three months but and um, as uh, Thomas Sandel mentioned it I remembered eight years ago uh, European Coalition for Israel uh, Thomas and I we organized the first uh, Holocaust Memorial Day here in the European Parliament and if I remember right there were three four Parliament members and uh, and then the staff all together about 20 and last year it was I think more than 500 uh, all together you know it's growing very fast and I, I have to say that that when we started I think that we didn't understand that it's that it's one day it's going to be so big event here and uh, and I have to say that that's one of the best thing during that time this eight years when I have been here in the Parliament what has done and uh, and uh, now it seems to me that uh, that, um, that uh, members of the parliament are more aware for that event and uh, even what happened in Europe. And of course, that's very good that at least once a year we commemorate, but of course it's important to organize the different kind of seminars here and, and try to be active in that field because, because uh, we, we know that uh, unfortunately at the moment in Europe the racist and anti-Semitism and that kind of voices is, is growing and we have to do something. And of course, it's also, uh, how can I say, a bad sign that here in the European Parliament we have some members who deny the Holocaust and, you know, uh, as you may know, I don't mention their names, but anyway, I mean that there is, here is someone. And, and of course, the awareness is very important. And it seems to me that um, when we talk about the Middle East issue, for example, there are a lot of that kind of parliament members who really don't know what is the history of the Middle East. They really don't know what was the Ottoman Empire. They don't know what was the uh, Balfour Declaration or what was the San Remo Conference. And oh, I have been in that kind of seminar that some people, uh, some politicians said in that way that there were the Palestinian state and then the Israelis come and occupied that. You know, something got this uh, totally <laughs> against all the history but it's it 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 shows me that that we need a lot of knowledge about the history because at the moment in some reasons there are many MEPs and many people in who, who really don't know what is the history what really happened 60 70 80 years ago and uh, and that's one very important target for us to to try to organize that kind of seminars and try to increase the, the, the knowledge uh, among the MEPs. And that's what the European Coalition for Israel do. Excellent. Yeah. I know you want to come into yes. this point, Henry. Uh, this is very important, what, what was said now. I think that um, uh, the, the fact that this year may be the red line border was really broken for the first time in 2000. 12, maybe 2011, but okay, that's not the problem. In France, in other countries, things were said, things were made against Jews that we didn't see from the Second World War on. And in a lot of countries it happens, in Belgium, in France, uh, in, in Hungary. Uh, look what happens in the parliament in Hungary, in, 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 uh, in Greece. We have so-called, I don't know why, neo, neo-Nazis official uh, uh, parties. I think what happens is first, as I said, uh, for the first time so many anti-Semitic attitudes, but for the first time, first time maybe, non-Jews are more and more thinking and understanding that attacks, anti-Semitism, are not concerning anymore in only Jews, but are also non-Jews. I was during a lot of years a member of ministerial staffs, I was chief of staff of ministerial cabinets and that was really my, my thinking about this, uh, about France. Really a lot of political responsibles thought that anti-Semitism is a problem only for Jews. Unfortunately, but only for Jews. I think that what is going to happen, and maybe it explains that you pass from five to 500 uh, members of the parliament here uh, 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 meeting, uh, I think that non-Jews, and that is maybe, maybe the hope, the hope that non-Jews, politicians, but people in the streets, journalists, understand now that anti-Semitism 
is today a problem for the all civilization and for all the peoples and not only for the Jews once again. Absolutely, I, I can completely agree. Also, um, uh, Henry, I also want to say, how do you feel about the rise of anti-Semitism here in Europe? And we've heard that Israel's ambassador to Denmark and the head of the Copenhagen's Jewish community has warned the Jewish community not to wear anything that visibly marks them out as being Jewish in fear that they will be uh, physically and violently attacked. Now, isn't that pretty shameful uh, to actually happen here in Europe? Well, it's a very important question. I think that the first explanation for this uh, situation is what I said before, uh, the, the, the red line we tried to build since uh, the end of World War II uh, was broken. Since one year, two years, doesn't matter. Um, uh, I think that today, too, uh, maybe uh, people understand also, as I said, not, this is concerning not only Jews, but all society, but also that anti-Zionism or anti-Israel is not now considered, understood as the same than anti-Semitism. During years and years, we had this situation where people said, OK, people criticizing, and that's the right of everybody, first in Israel, people are criticizing their government and very sharp, so that's not the problem to criticize Israel or the government of Israel. But now, people understand more and more they don't like that. Now, people don't like that, but now they are faced with the reality. This hate towards Israel and Israelis is really a question of anti-Semitism. And now in Belgium, for instance, and I speak about what I know the best is my, my country, it's clear that the importation of the conflict of the Middle East is one major explanation of what happens here in the streets, like in Paris, like in Brussels. And now we have to work with the politicians, with the journalists. We have to work very hard and very quick and very quick about this situation. We must ask our medias, we must ask our politicians to do everything, even uh, I speak as a lawyer, on legal aspects, uh, 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 police aspects. We have to mention that to impeach that this uh, criticism of Israel is becoming anti-Semitism and allowed, saying, OK, they have the right to criticize Israel. Of course, everybody has the right to criticize Israel. But then we understand when we, ch we check what happens in the streets, we see the, 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 the words uh, utilized. They are anti-Semitic words and not uh, anti-Israel. Anti and what's, what's said before, and I will end with this, a lot of these people criticizing Israel, they don't know anything about the Middle East and more than about Israel or Middle East. They don't know anything about the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. When you speak, you go in the streets during a, a rally and you speak with young Arabs here in my country in Belgium, you said, OK, I understand you are defending the interests of the Palestinian people. Why? How? The conversation is finishing there because, unfortunately, they don't know anything about this general conflict of the Middle East, even about the Palestinians that are fighting for or supposed to fighting for against Israeli, that means against Jews in Belgium or in France. Yeah. The uh, next subject we are going to discuss is the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Syria, particularly now there's a great fear that uh, the stockpile of chemical and biological weapons held by the regime could fall into the hands of dangerous Islamist groups in Syria. Um, Hanu, how concerned is the European Union um, about the situation in Syria concerning that there are real dangers now that uh, Assad's uh, chemical and biological weapons could fall into the hands of dangerous Islamists organisations that are fighting alongside the rebels in the civil war in Syria? Of course, European Parliament is very concerned and uh, worry about what happened there. But it seems to me that at the moment, the European Union and the Parliament, they don't know what to do. They don't have that kind of uh, tools to, to do, such the resolutions and uh, communiques, but it's not work, you know. And, uh, and of course, it seems that it's uh, more this discussion in the United Nations. And uh, the big problem is at the moment that some countries like Russia, it's not in the in the same line with uh, some others, the, like the European Union and the United States. So that, that's a big 
big problem, but uh, it seems to me that the European Union really would like to do something, but we don't find a way, or the Union is not find a way how to go there. Me, our, our high representative, Lady Astons, she has, she gave and she con going to, uh, will give the speeches concerning the situation and, and, and so on, but it seems that there's no influence at the moment, and of course, <clears throat> it's a it's a big question mark. What is the, what is the right way to do? What's the right way way to act? And of course, when the European Union is not a uh, military power, we we don't have that kind of tool that we can make some intervention. So we can just try to find the way how we can continue the, the uh, continue discussions or how maybe we can put uh, both. Uh, parties in the one one table and started the negotiations but at the moment only what I can say that it seems to me that um, we we don't have that kind of tools so only resolutions and it seems that it's not helped uh, and Thomas isn't there a great danger that the situation in Syria could escalate uh, certainly by involving the neighbors of Syria particularly Israel and that if Israeli intelligence confirm that uh, ke dangerous chemical and biological weapons could fall into groups like Al-Qaeda, uh, elements of the Muslim Brotherhood, other Salafist uh, terrorist-linked organizations, even Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, then Israel may have to go to war in order to protect our citizens. Yeah. And we could see a new war in the Middle East. Uh, absolutely. And um, I recall that the prime minister recently spoke about this uh, danger. Uh, I basically see three different scenarios, as you rightly mentioned, uh, scenario that either Hezbollah or, or the different jihadist group in Syria would uh, uh, get the stockpile of, of Assad or biological or, or chemical weapons. And this, of course, would, would again, again be a game changer in the whole region. But I also see, and this is possibly my greatest concern, that Syria would try to um, provoke Israel into the conflict. And, and we know too well from recent history how even when Arab people are fighting you know, between themselves, that what seems to unite the region more than anything else is to be able to blame everything on Israel. So, so there are those who, who see a scenario where um, Assad would, at the, the, the last option he would have, people say, would either be to use uh, chemical weapons against Israel or to draw Israel directly into the conflict, because this way it could again change the dynamics. And, and uh, uh, I think this is something that we all of us have to take into consideration, and I think that uh, Catherine Ashton and the United Nations and the European Union should be aware of this uh, uh, possibility. And, and they should make very clear guidelines already now to say that what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. But, but um, yes, the, the threat towards Israel is not only Iran, it's increasingly from the north, from Syria and, and from Lebanon. Mm. And, uh, Henry, we've heard news this week that um, the UN are very concerned about uh, the ongoing civil war taking place in Syria. It's actually beginning to spill over onto Israel's Golan Heights, which is the border between Israel and Syria. And so the UN are thinking of pulling out uh, their UN peacekeeping forces that have been there since the 1973 Yom Kippur War and have been successful in keeping the ceasefire between Israel and Syria. Isn't there a great danger if the UN pull out, this will just allow a greater escalation of the conflict and could lead to a future war between Israel and Syria? You're right. Uh, and as Thomas said now, I think there's a danger for everybody in this region because this region is, is starting in Iran, then Syria, uh, Hezbollah and uh, Hamas and with the new so-called new Egypt. It's a very surrounding dangerous situation, not only for Israel, for the UN and for all other countries uh, in this region. So we know that uh, um, Russia is forbidding for the moment uh, a solution. Uh, we saw the last declaration of President Assad. We saw the last declaration of Mr. Putin. So I don't have a uh, big hope about the evolution of the situation. There's a danger to try to involve Israel, of course, uh, through the Golan Heights.
uh, or, or through other actions, uh, uh, of course. But this, we must be very careful about this, this line uh, starting in Tehran and, and ending in, in, in Cairo, uh, because nobody knows what it's going to, to become. And the question is why other countries do not act like they act, for instance, or they, they want to act in Libya. Uh, I think that a lot of countries, uh, democratic countries, are afraid about the f what happened in Tunisia, what happened in, in, in Egypt. Uh, so maybe psychologically, uh, uh, not objectively, but psychologi uh, psychologically, they are maybe afraid to do more against Syria because they think, and I, I, I think it's, it's right, they think that if it's terrible to say that if Mr. Assad will uh, finish his career, and we hope so, what will happen after him worse? I think yes. So that's maybe the reason which impeach politicians to do more, because everybody understands what happens there. Everybody knows that what they did in Libya could be done in Syria, of course. I think this is the explanation. You can be, you can agree with it. You cannot agree with it. But I think that is the explanation of this weak reaction uh, uh, yeah. of people that understands what happened in Syria. So the danger is very big. The question is always since the very beginning: till where Mr. Assad can go without a reaction uh, from the NATO or from any other countries? Uh, now the new president of the United States who is the old one, Mr. Obama. Uh, 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 France uh, is trying to, to work. We don't know what Mr. Hollande uh, is thinking about, it, about this situation. I think really the f problem is there. Are they going to do what, they, what, what was so easy, easy uh, to do in Libya or not? Uh, I think that uh, we, we yeah. must be very, ca very careful about it and the uh, democracies must be very careful. But I, can understand that it's very difficult to estimate in this region. It's so difficult to estimate what can happen with people like Mr. Assad. It's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, and, and Thomas, I really want to bring you into this one as well. It's my impression that the uh, European Union is uh, more concerned about stopping Jewish homes being built, trying to boycott and label Israeli produce produced in the West Bank or Judea and Samaria, than actually about confronting the real dangers that are posed in the Middle East by dangerous Islamist groups that have either come to power in the Middle East uh, through the Arab Spring or on the verge of power. Well, you're, you're absolutely right, and I, and I think if I could give advice to the European Parliament, I think the first step would have to be to you have to identify who, who are your friends and how do you find a friend. A friend is usually someone who shares your values. It shouldn't be rocket science in the Middle East to look country to country and say, well, which countries in this region are sharing the basic fundamental values of, of the European Union. Um, the dilemma which we have is today that, that the European Union, Western community, seems to be more concerned about Israel and, and you know, acts of Israel being wise or not wise as building homes, extending a home, than they are to the overall threat to the whole region. We saw the latest reports from the United Nations, 60,000 killed in the, in the civil war so far. You don't see people going out on the streets anywhere in Europe. You don't see people writing letters to the editors. You don't see people being overly concerned. But once Netanyahu, and again I said wisely or not wisely, not for me to say, decides to, to build a number of homes in, in historical Jerusalem, uh, this is what makes European leaders, including Catherine Ashton, come out and become aggressive and, and say, well, this is a real threat to, to peace in the Middle East. Um, I'm sorry, but as a layperson, given my education in international law and political science, I cannot quite follow. And I think this is where, where there has to be a radical shift in thinking. Um, so we don't end up in a situation where we are today, where we don't really have any good options in a situation like Syria. It's, it's perhaps going from bad to worse. And, and here I expect more leadership of the European Union and, and by the United States. And uh, Hanu, also, what was your opinion? Does Baroness Ashton and the 
EU commissioners really understand the dangers and the threat of a destabilized Middle East and how this poses a direct threat to European security? I hope that they understand and I think that they are very they, 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 they have a lot of information uh, and what is the situation there. But of course, as Thomas said, it seems to me also that uh, during the last three, four months here in the European Parliament, for, ex for example, we have had to discuss much more concerning the, concerning the uh, Israel or, or West Bank or Gaza than the Syria. And, uh, and for example, uh, boycott against the, the goods from the uh, West Bank. It, it has been the big chapstick here. And, you know, it seems to me that, as I already said, that, that in Syria issue, we don't have the tools what to do. And, you know, it, then it's easier to speak about Israel and blame to Israel and, and, and so on. So, of course, uh, as a member of the parliament, uh, and uh, it seems to me that the European Union is a little bit loose um, the understanding what is the European Union? The European Union is a union of the values, mm -hmm. democracy, human rights, freedom, express, and, and, and then uh, rule of law principles. And I think that that's what we have to do in the Middle East also, to promote the democracy, promote uh, uh, human rights. But it seems that, that <clears throat> we are not able to do that at the moment, you know, and, uh, and uh, for example, uh, in the Syria case, we are more or less we surrender, you know, that we say that we, we don't know what to do. But of course, of course, uh, I hope that they are informed. But of course, oh, one other issue is also that uh, there are some political wheels. And um, in the old days, and it seems to me that even in nowadays, some left politicians, some socialists, they have some sympathy for the Arab countries. And it, it seems to me that even though that uh, that kind of things, what they can't accept happen there. They try to understand and they try to understand then and, and there's some kind of sympathy. And in some reasons, Israel is that what it's easy to blame be. And, and even though that Israel shares the same values, what, what, we, what we have in the European Union. Uh, gentlemen, down to, uh, I believe, the last five minutes of the programme. And uh, this programme slide by. So we're on our final issue, really. So it's uh, maybe just a couple of minutes, less than a couple of minutes each on this one. And, and this issue that we're going to discuss now is the growing menace of Iran. Now that Israel's had a recent conflict with uh, Hamas in Gaza after an escalation of rockets and missiles have uh, been rained down upon southern Israel, um, which has paralysed over a million Israelis from going to schools, going to hospitals, going to the work, uh, we now find the Iranian regime is refunding um, Hamas. Isn't it important if Europe wants to play a major role in the Middle East, then they have to find ways to actually prevent Iran from smuggling and giving weapons to rearm Hamas, but also, more dangerously, Hezbollah in the north uh, southern Lebanon. Uh, Henry, over to you. Well, <laughs> the problem is what Hanu said uh, just before I speak. Um, uh, there's always one way to criticize and to see what happens in Israel and one way to see or not to see, or not willing to see, what happens uh, not far from Israel. And the case about Gaza is exactly the good example. Um, we, we heard, we saw false pictures. And for the first time, thanks to internet, for this time, thanks to internet, we saw that uh, when they tried to put on the net uh, pictures, false pictures, about, uh, for instance, unfortunately, a child uh, killed by Israeli army, it was in five, min five minutes after, it was shown on internet that this was what was, was false, because it was a child from, him, from Syria, killed by the Syrian uh, army. Uh, a few times they tried uh, with these pictures, like before, but before it was successful, because nobody uh, destroyed the system. This time, internet destroyed uh, I think this is very interesting. This time, the so-called bad pictures about Israeli action, it doesn't function because people on internet sh sh uh, was was working and showing what was the real picture. Very important. Uh, 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 so maybe they will not try it next time. Uh, I think really in this case of Gaza, 
we see, because there are not enough dead people, it's terrible to say that, enough uh, dead people in Israel, they say, okay, let's see what happens in Gaza. And you have words, we spoke about uh, um, uh, Holocaust, the words concentration camps. In, in, in French, we listen always to this uh, sentence, uh, prison, uh, camp concentration à ciel ouvert, prison à ciel ouvert. Uh, 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 it's terrible, you know, and when you tell people, look, go on, once again on the internet and look what happens in Gaza, really, what happens in Gaza. How is Gaza living with the Hamas? Mm. Nobody wants to check it, but when one soldier is doing something bad, wow, it's terrible. So we are always in this double uh, uh, point of view. Uh, I think now it's impossible to say that they don't see the difference. Yeah. But Unfortunately, they go on with this difference, and that's maybe the work of the politicians, European politicians, mainly because it's here in Europe that we have this, this, this situation more and more, always criticizing Israel, never criticizing Arab countries. Yeah. Uh, 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 and, uh, and Thomas, I just want to bring you in very, very quickly here. I've got to ask you the question, are economic sanctions that the European Union are spearheading actually working? If we continue to see that Iran is on the brink of developing nuclear weapons, they're rearming Hamas and their continued support for Hezbollah uh, with rockets that are capable of reaching Tel Aviv pose a major, major threat. Well, um I have to be <laughs> have to be sh short. So, sh short answer is is no. Uh, but I would like to come back and and let this be my final comment uh, to say that the whole situation is uh, what I would call a battle of uh, ideas. And and you mentioned the internet, images, pictures, concepts. And uh, this is why the war today is is different than what it was in the past. And I always take this example. Holocaust didn't happen because Hitler woke up one morning and said he's going to kill all the Jews. It, it was a long, long process and it started with words, it started with ideas and that's why we need to get involved on this level. And, and uh, this is what we're doing through European Coalition for Israel, this is what uh, Hanno Takla is doing in the European Parliament and everyone can do something. So I wouldn't want to leave you with the illusion that nothing can be done. Many good things can be done and have been achieved. Yeah. And, uh, right, we've come almost to the end of the programme. So I want to thank you very much, uh, Hanno. And it's so very important that our Christian viewers get behind you to pray for you and support you because you're making a real stand on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people. And Henry, I think it's important as Christians here that we acknowledge the great contribution that the uh, Jewish community has made through the centuries. Uh, and that's why we're going to stand with you and fight with you to fight against anti-Semitism and tell the truth about Israel and the truth about the Middle East. And uh, I want to thank you all for watching today's uh, Middle East report here from the European Parliament in the heart of Europe.